What images come to your mind when you think of madness, the mads, or the treatment of the mad? Something like this, perhaps, taken from the 1946 film Bedlam? Are they not witty, Mistress Bath? Oh, look at the frolic this one treats himself to. All day long, weaving nets to catch peacocks for the royal dinner. They're all so lonely. They're all in themselves and by themselves. They pay no heed to us. Oh, you notice that? They have their world and we have ours. Like separate dreams. Ours is a human world. Theirs is a bestial world. Without reason, without soul. They're animals. Summer dogs, these I beat. Summer pigs, those I let wallow in their own filth. Summer tigers, these I cage. Some like this one are doves. I've seen enough. But you haven't seen the other cages. I've seen enough. Or perhaps something more violent like this, taken from the 2015 film of the same name. I wouldn't tell you twice. In today's politically correct world, some people can take offence from nicknames for madness. A few months ago, an MP went on the news to blast Poundland for launching fake M&M chocolate peanuts called Nutters. The MP for Norfolk, Norman Lamb, worried that the use of this term could discourage young people from seeking help for their mental health difficulties. So what does being, what does being mad mean, both now and in the past? The Oxford English Dictionary defines mad as mentally ill or insane, as well as very enthusiastic about something, e.g. mad about football, or very angry, e.g. the teacher went mad when the pupil didn't hand in their homework. So what about being insane? What exactly does that mean? This gives a little more insight. It's having a state of mind which prevents normal perception, behaviour or social interaction, or being seriously mentally ill. And the definition of mental illness? A condition which causes serious disorder in a person's behaviour or thinking. What becomes clear when looking at key novels published within the mid-19th century is that the state of madness could be used simply as a terrifying tool to shut people, particularly women, away. And I say terrifying for two reasons. Firstly, as once in a lunatic asylum, there appeared to be little chance to legitimately leave. And secondly, the criteria for being deemed mad appeared utterly subjective, leaving the impression that those sane but unlucky were as likely to be sectioned as those suffering from genuine mental angst. William Wilkie Collins' 1860 novel, The Women in White, is a terrific read. It opens with a woman in white, frantically escaping from a lunatic asylum, although we don't realise this is where she is running away from until afterwards. Here's how the BBC 1997 movie version of the novel captures this encounter. Is that the road to London? Do you hear me? Yes, it leads to St John's Wood and the Regent's Park. Excuse me, I, I was rather startled. I've done nothing wrong. May I 
trust you? Tell me how I can help you. And if I can, I will. You are very kind. And I'm very grateful to have met you. Is it too late? If you could show me where to get a fly. And if you will promise to let me leave you how and when I please. I have a friend in London who will be very glad to receive me. I want nothing else. Are you sure your friend will receive you at this late hour? <sighs> Cold. Will you promise? Yes. In both the film and the novel, our first impressions of the women in white, someone deemed deem mad enough to be locked up within a lunatic asylum, are that she is merely vulnerable and scared, rather than seriously disordered in her thinking or behaviour, to come back to our definition of insanity. Of course, there is something strange and unsettling to see a woman all dressed in white, alone, late at, late at night, especially for a Victorian reader with firm ideas about propriety and appropriate behaviour for a woman. But the woman is trying to escape, and what better time to do it when it's dark? And as we read more of The Women in White, the vulnerability of this woman, later revealed to be called Anne Catherick, becomes more apparent, and by extension, her confinement to a lunatic asylum seems all the more barbaric, unfair and immoral. The latter stages of the novel reveal that the primary motive for her being consigned to a lunatic asylum is that a man, Sir Percival Glyde, is worried that she may unwittingly act in a way which results in the revelation of his own guilty secret, his own illegitimacy. Yes, Anne Catherick in the past has shown a slightly odd obsession with wearing white and has spoken indiscreetly and stubbornly within her village, but nothing to justify the finite verdict of madness which in the 19th century could lead to indefinite prison and suffering. So the woman in white shows how the projection of madness upon the vulnerable could be used to silence and control women. The first example is the one previously mentioned, to silence Anne Catherick so Sir Percival Glyde's illegitimacy can remain a secret. But there's another example which is even more shocking. I will try to summarise what is an outrageous and quite complex plot. Illegitimate Sir Percival Glyde has an equally villainous friend, an Italian who's called Count Fosco. Both need money, hence Sir Percival's marriage to Laura Fairley. The only way that Sir Percival could gain access to Laura's private inheritance of £20,000 is if she dies before him. Sir Percival doesn't kill Laura, but it arguably does something which many people would think is worse. Laura Fairley bears a startling resemblance to Anne Catherick, the woman in white, and we later find out that this is because they are half-sisters. Knowing that Anne Catherick is dying, the two villains set up an outrageous scam in which the two identities are switched. They successfully convince the people that matter that Anne Catherick is Laura Fairley and Laura Fairley is Anne Catherick. So what this means is that when Anne Catherick dies, Sir Percival can inherit his wife Laura's £20,000, even though she is alive, because of course Laura is now known as Anne Catherick and is in the lunatic asylum. So within this second example, we have the cruelty of someone being locked up in a lunatic asylum, Laura Fairley, who isn't mad, but is thought to be mad, of course, because she, because she will swear blind, actually, that she isn't Anne Catherick, and no one will believe her. What does this imply about 19th century notions of madness and perceptions of mental health? What stands out for me is that those deemed mad immediately lose their voice and become silenced. That those deemed mad lose all rights. Laura Fairley is not Anne Catherick and is able to articulate this, but because she is in a mental, island, mental asylum, because she is deemed mad, and because she looks very similar to the woman who was in before her, Anne Catherick, the truth can be disregarded entirely. This also implies a disgracefully binary attitude towards madness and sanity. Those who are sane must be listened to at all times. Um, those who are insane cannot be trusted or referred to at any time. Isn't this terrifying? through bad luck or difficult circumstances or unscrupulous men, combined with a contemporary lack of insight into mental illness, you could end up in a position where you are imprisoned for the rest of your miserable life. 
Sarah Walters' 2002 um, historical lesbian novel, Fingersmith, takes inspiration from the women in white and also includes an outrageous identity swap, resulting in an innocent sane woman finding herself deposed at a madhouse. Sue Trinde in Fingersmith is a feisty, straight-talking, working-class woman who finds herself the victim of an extraordinary plot. She thinks that she is plotting to get her newest boss, Maud, committed to a, a lunatic asylum in exchange for a £3,000 pay payment, but actually the truth is, is that Maud has already agreed to an inverse plot with Gentleman, that's his nickname, which will actually imprison her, i.e. Sue, to that same madhouse. As in The Woman in White, identities are swapped, meaning that a furious Sue has genuine cause to rant and rave about being admitted to the madhouse. She isn't Maud. It is Maud who should be admitted. Yet, the more she rants and raves, the crazier she seems. Here's the moment in the novel when she realises that she's been tricked. It was in that second that I guessed at last the filthy trick that gentleman had played on me. I howled. You bloody swine, I cried, twisting again and pulling towards him. You fuckster! Oh! He stood in the doorway of the coach, making it tilt. The doctor gripped me harder and his face grew stern. There's no place for words like those in my house, Mrs Rivers, he said. You sod, I said to him. Can't you see what he's done? Can't you see the dodge of it? It ain't me you want, it's... I still pulled and he still held me, but now I looked past him to the swaying coats. Gentleman had moved back, his hand before his face. Beyond him, the light in bars upon her from the louved blinds sat moored. Her face was thin, her hair was dull, her dress was worn with use like a servant's dress. Her eyes were wild with tears starting in them, but beyond the tears her gaze was hard, hard as marble, hard as brass, hard as a pearl and the grit that lies inside it. Dr Christie saw me looking. Now why do you stare, he said. You know your own maid, I think. I could not speak. She could, however. She said in a trembling voice, not her own. My own poor mistress. Oh, my heart is breaking. You thought her a pigeon. Pigeon, my ass. That bitch knew everything. She had been in on it from the start. So in these two novels, the mental asylum is used as a means to control and silence women who do not appear to be mad enough to be fairly locked away. What was life like inside? The woman in white doesn't give much information on this score. We know that Anne Catherick is desperate to leave, so much so that um, she, she tries to escape in such a dangerous way, but few details are provided why. We receive a little information about Laura Fairley walking discon disconsolately and listlessly within the grounds of the mental asylum, but little else. Fingersmith, however, does aim to shed light on these madhouses, and I'd like to share with you now a vivid episode in which some nurses pay a little game on identity swap victim Sue Trinder. Shut up, they said. We aren't going to hurt you. We only want to see who's heaviest out of Nurse Bacon, Nurse Spiller and Nurse Flu. We only want to see which of them will make you squeak most. Are you ready? Get off me! Get off me! I'll tell Dr Christie! Someone hit me in the face. Someone else jerked my leg. Spoil sport, they said. Now, who's going to go on her first? I will. I heard Nurse Flew say, and the others moved back a little for her to come forward. She was smoothing down her gown. Have you got her, she said. We've got her. Right. Hold her still. Then they pulled me tight as if I were a wet sheet and they meant to wring me. My thoughts at that moment aren't fit to be described. I was sure they would tear the arms and legs off me. I was sure they would snap my bones. I started to shout and again I was struck in the face and jerked about, so then I fell silent. Then Nurse Flew got onto the bed and, lifting up her skirt, knelt astride of me. The bed gave a creak. She rubbed her hands and fixed me with her swivel eye. Here I come, she said, making to fall upon me. But the fall never came, though I screwed up my face and drew in my breath to take it. Nurse Bacon had stopped her. No dropping, she said. Dropping won't be fair. Go down slowly or not at all. So Nurse Flew moved back and then came slowly forward and lowered herself down by her hands and knees until her weight was all upon me. The breath I had drawn in was all squeezed out. I think if I had had a floor underneath me instead of a bed, she would have killed me. My eyes, my nose and mouth began to run. Please, I said. She cries please, said the dark-haired nurse. That means five points to Nurse Flew. And of course what's clear within this extract here is just how helpless and vulnerable 
people were within these lunatic asylums and really that you had no rights at all. Um, and the treatment there, you can see that um, Sue Trinder is being treated really as an animal rather than as a human being. Mary Elizabeth Braddon's Lady Audley's Secret was published two years after The Women in White in 1862. And once again, this delves into the realms of madness. However, this controversial novel explores the idea of what it means to be mad far more than The Women in White, in which madness is essentially a, sen a, a sensational plot device rather than something to be probed, explored and understood. In some places, it suggests a more intelligent, nuanced understanding of madness, moving away from the oversimplistic notion that either you are mad or completely sane for all your life. In volume two, the narrator reflects compassionately upon mental health issues. She writes, Madhouses are large and only too numerous, yet surely it is strange that they're not larger when we think of how many helpless wretches must beat their brains against this hopeless persistency of that orderly outward world, as compared with the storm and tempest, the riot and confusion within, when we remember how many minds must tremble upon the narrow boundary between reason and unreason, mad today and sane tomorrow, mad yesterday and sane today. I think this is so true. All of us have the potential, given certain circumstances, to become less sure of ourselves, less confident about our minds. And if we recognise this, does, not, does this not impact upon the way we see others more obviously struggling, resulting in greater empathy, kindness and maybe practical support? In another section, Braddon refers to one of the great 18th century intellectuals, Dr Samuel Johnson. Yes, he had an astounding intellectual reputation, but he also had a nervous breakdown. Who can forget that almost terrible picture of Dr Samuel Johnson? The awful disputant of the clubroom, solemn, ponderous, severe and merciless, the admiration and the terror of humble Bozzy, the stern monitor of gentle Oliver, the friend of Garrick and Reynolds tonight. And before sunset tomorrow, a weak, miserable old man, discovered by good Mr and Mrs Thrale, kneeling upon the floor of his lonely chamber, in an agony of childish terror and confusion, and praying to a merciful God for the preservation of his wits. I think the memory of that dreadful afternoon, and of the tender care he then received, should have taught the doctor to keep his hand steady at Streatham, when he took his bedroom candlestick, from which it was his habit to shower rivulets of molten wax upon the costly carpet of his beautiful protectress, and might have even had a more enduring effect, and taught him to be merciful, when the brewer's widow went mad in her turn, and married that dreadful creature, the Italian singer, who has not been, or is not to be mad, in some lonely hour of life, who is quite safe from the trembling of the balance? And this final rhetorical question, who is quite safe from the trembling of the balance, is not answered. But of course, the answer is implicit. None of us are safe. In other sections of Mary Elizabeth Brown's novel, madness is presented less sympathetically, most notably in the presentation of the novel's heroine come villain, Lady Audley herself. Where to start with such a glorious, beautiful, yet ruthless character? At the beginning of the novel, she's introduced as the image of perfection, with beautiful blonde hair, permanently sunny disposition, brilliant and numerous accomplishments, and even better, she's come from nowhere to become the extremely wealthy wife of the, the lovely, genial, polite Sir Michael Audley. However, as the novel goes on, both the reader and Sir Michael's nephew, Robert Audley, become increasingly convinced that a sinister secret lies behind this image of happy perfection. The tension and interest in the novel lies in the battle between Lady, Lady Audley and Robert Audley in their quest to, for, for Lady Audley's sake, preserve her position, or in Robert's case, to do his moral duty by exposing the truth. For Lady Audley has actually committed bigamy by marrying Sir Michael. Even worse, when her first husband reappears, she tries to kill him and believes that she's been successful. I'd love us to read the section of the novel in which Lady Audley finally admits her crimes to her nemesis. She is alone with Robert Audley, broken beyond endurance by his persistent, slowly successful investigations into her past. Have a listen to what she says. The woman rose suddenly and stood before him erect and resolute, with her hair dashed away from her face and her eyes glittering. Bring Sir Michael, she cried. Bring him here and I will confess anything, everything. What do I care? 
God knows I've struggled hard enough against you and fought the battle patiently enough, but you have conquered Mr. Robert Audley. It is a great triumph, is it not a wonderful victory? You have used your cool, calculating, frigid, luminous intellect to a noble purpose. You have conquered a mad woman. A mad woman? cried Mr. Audley. Yes, a mad woman. When you say that I killed George Talboys, you say the truth. When you say that I murdered him treacherously and foully, you lie. I killed him because I am mad. Because my intellect is a little way upon the wrong side of that narrow boundary line between sanity and insanity. Because when George Talboys goaded me, as you have goaded me, and reproached me, and threatened me, my mind, never properly balanced, utterly lost its balance, and I was mad. Bring Sir Michael, and bring him quickly. If he is to be told one thing, let him be told everything. Let him hear the secret of my life. What do we make of this extraordinary confession, and the cold calculating apportioning of blame um, onto her so-called madness? Indeed, how mad is a person who can so precisely put down a murder to her intellect being a little way upon the wrong side of that narrow boundary line between sanity and insanity? As the doctor brought in to assess Lady Audley later confirms, someone proved to be mad would be deemed irresponsible for her actions, meaning that they would be detained within a mental health asylum rather than publicly tried for murder. Now I'm not suggesting that Lady Audley at this point is thinking so, so far ahead, but if, sanity means, um, sorry, but if insanity means a state of mind which prevents normal perception, behaviour or social interaction, there seems little evidence of this during the exchange that we've just heard. I think, therefore I am, is one thing. I say I'm mad, therefore I am, is quite another. Doubts about Lady Audley's insanity remain in the novel, and the doctor of the mad initially refuses to accept the claims, telling Robert Audley, I do not believe that she is mad, because there is no evidence of madness in anything that she has done. She ran away from her home, because her home was not a pleasant one, and she left it in the hope of finding a better. There is no there, there is no madness in that. She committed the crime of bigamy, because by that time she obtained fortune and position. There is no madness there. When she found herself in a desperate position, she did not grow desperate, she employed intelligent means, and she carried out a conspiracy which required coolness and deliberation in its execution. There is no madness in that. Doubts or not, the most convenient thing for the respectability of the family is for Lady Audley to disappear as soon as possible, and never to be seen again. Thus, as previously discussed, the institution of a mental asylum comes in extremely handy for men. Lady Audley is sent to a maison de santé in Belgium, and she quite recognises that the French term makes the mental asylum the madhouse sound far more civilised than the, 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 the term within the English language. And the diagnosis of madness facilitates silencing, albeit a far more dangerous woman, than either Anne Catherick or Laura Fairley in The Women in White. Let's hear an extract of Lady Audley arriving at this grim-sounding place. The coachman led his wretched horses into this courtyard and piloted the vehicle to the principal doorway of the house, a great mansion of grey stone, with several long ranges of windows, many of which were dimly lighted, and looked out like the pale eyes of weary watchers upon the darkness of the night. My lady, watchful and quiet as the cold stars in the wintry sky, looked up at these casements with an earnest and scrutinising gaze. One of the windows was shrouded by a scanty curtain of faded red, and upon this curtain there went and came a dark shadow, the shadow of a woman with a fantastic headdress, the shadow of a restless creature, who paced perpetually backwards and forwards before the window. Sir Michael Audley's wicked wife laid her hand suddenly upon Robert's arm and pointed with the other hand to this curtained window. I know where you have brought me, she said. This is a madhouse. And do these themes not remind you of another far more famous 19th century novel? Marriage for money and or position, bigamy or attempted bigamy, a woman being branded mad and locked away? Anyone? For well, 15 years, of course, prior to the publication of Lady Audley's Secret, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre was published. It tells the story of plain-looking, determined to be self-sufficient and moral Jane Eyre, who moves from a school for orphans to become a governess at Thornfield Hall. Her master is the brooding, unpredictable, abrupt Mr Rochester, and the pair fall in love and prepare to marry. Trouble is, Rochester's already married and has a mad wife locked away within a random attic of his sprawling pile. 
When he tries to commit bigamy and fails, he dramatically leads the small wedding party to meet his mad wife, who dutifully performs like a crazed mad woman for the occasion. He is pitied sincerely by both Jane, all present, and the reader. Whilst his relationship with Jane is abruptly terminated, he remains in possession of his fortune, which has been boosted, of course, by his mad wife's £30,000. Roger also keeps his property, and there's no question of him being deemed mad. Compare this to Lady Audley in Lady Audley's Secret. Unlike Rochester, when she commits bigamy, she has virtually no money and is not sure whether her first husband is alive or dead. He went off to Australia to make their fortune without consulting her and, hasn't, and she hasn't heard from him since. Two people in similar-ish circumstances. Is it fair that one, the man, is duly empathised with and his ability to, to reason remain unquestioned, whilst the other, the woman, is conveniently declared man, mad, albeit for crimes in addition to her bigamy. It's also worth looking more closely at the presentation of this so-called mad wife of Rochester, called Bertha Mason, particularly with a modern reader's more eagle eye for patriarchy and more nuanced understanding of mental illness. Well, prior to Jane's arrival, Bertha has been locked up in the attic room for 10 years. Before Jane uncovers her identity, there are a series of disturbing sounds and actions which certainly tick the boxes for stereotypical definitions of madness. Crazy laughs, the same peel, the same low, ha ha! Violent, dangerous, unexpected actions. Setting Rochester's bed on fire, resulting in tongues of flame darting around his bed and curtains. But I ask you this, would not all of our minds begin to deteriorate and rot after such a long period confined with absolutely nothing to do? So the question then needs to be this, was Bertha, Bertha equally mad and dangerous before being confined? It's difficult to answer this question, and we need to rely on the narratives of two people with vested interest in the answer being an overwhelming yes. Jane herself, who needed the death of Bertha to become Roger, Ro Rochester's wife, as occurs in the happy ever ending, um, ending of the novel, and her husband. Well, when forced to tell the truth, or his version of the truth, when his plot to bigamously marry Jane is thwarted, Rochester reveals how his marriage came about, before it promptly, um, before it promptly disintegrated. Her family wished to secure me because I was of a good race, and so did she. They showed her to me in parties, splendidly dressed. I seldom saw her alone and had very little private conversation with her. She flattered me and lavishly displayed for my pleasure her charms and accomplishments. All the men in her circle seemed to admire her and envy me. I was dazzled, stimulated, my senses were excited, and being ignorant, raw and inexperienced, I thought I loved her. There is no folly so besotted that the idiotic rivalries of society, the prurience, the rashness, the blindness of youth will not hurry a man to its commission. Her relatives encouraged me, competitors piqued me, she allured me, a marriage was achieved almost before I knew where I was. Oh, I have no respect for myself when I think of that act. An agony of inward contempt masters me. I never loved, I never esteemed, I did not even know her. I was not sure of the existence of one virtue in her nature. I had marked neither modesty, nor benevolence, nor candour, nor refinement in her mind or manners. And I married her, gross, grovelling, mole-eyed blockhead that I was. With less sin I might have but let me remember to whom I am speaking. My bride's mother I had never seen. I understood she was dead. The honeymoon over, I learned my mistake. She was only mad and shut up in a lunatic asylum. There was a younger brother too, a complete dumb idiot. The elder one, whom you have seen, and whom I cannot hate while I abhor all his kindred, because he has some grains of affection in his feeble mind, shown in the continued interest he takes in his wretched sister, and also in a dog-like attachment he once bore me will probably be in the same state one day. My father and my brother Roland knew all this, but they thought only of the £30,000 and joined in the plot against me. These were vile discoveries, but except for the treachery of concealment, I should have made them no subject of reproach to my wife, even when I found her nature wholly alien to mine, her taste obnoxious to me, her cast of mind common, low, narrow, and singularly incapable of being led to anything higher expanded to anything larger, when I found that I could not pass a single evening nor even a single hour of the day with her in comfort. That kindly conversation could not be sustained between us, because whatever topic I started, immediately received from her a turn at once coarse and trite, perverse and imbecile, 
when I perceived that I should never have a quiet or settled household because no servant would bear the continued outbreaks of her violence and unreasonable temper, all the vexations of her absurd contradictory exacting orders. Even then I restrained myself. I eschewed upbraiding. I could tell a remonstrance. I tried to defile my repentance and disgust in secret. I repressed the deep antipathy I felt. Jane, I will not trouble you with abominable details. Some strong words shall express what I have to say. I lived with that woman upstairs four years, and before that time she had tried me indeed. Her character ripened and developed with frightful rapidity. Her vices sprang up fast and rank. They were so strong, only cruelty would check them, and I would not use cruelty. What a pygmy intellect she had, and what giant propensities! How fearful were the curses those propensities entailed on me! Bertha Mason, the true daughter of an infamous mother, dragged me through all the hideous and degrading agonies which must attend a man bound to a wife at once intemperate and unchaste. OK, let's try to read um, between the lines and specify exactly what led Rochester to conclude that life with Bertha was intolerable, which he would later be able to, to blame on her developing madness. Well, her mother is in a lunatic asylum. Well, as a doctor in Lady Audley's secret confirms, madness is not necessarily transmitted from mother to daughter. Bertha has different tastes to him, obnoxious he calls them. Her cast of mind is common, low and narrow, and singularly incapable of being led to anything higher, expanded to anything larger. So to translate to a modern context, she prefers playing Call of Duty to reading poetry and sighing about nature. So far, a little frustrating perhaps for both parties, but nothing obviously smacking of madness. The pair struggle to sustain conversation, because whatever topic Rochester started, it immediately received from her a turn, at once coarse and trite, perverse and imbecile. So they rout. Just as many, just as many couples living together for the first time start niggling at each other and looking for opportunities to nitpick. Imbecile, of course, means someone who behaves in an extremely stupid way. So perhaps Bertha Mason isn't bright. But not being bright, surely, doesn't make one mad enough to be locked up for ten years, though. Rochester refers to her violent and unreasonable temper, or the vexations of her absurd, contradictory, exacting orders for the servants. So one minute she would ask the servants to prepare a lovely leg of lamb for dinner, the next minute she would change her mind and demand fillet of fish. Frustrating for the servants, perhaps, but unheard of in their line of business? I think not. She had a pygmy intellect. Once again, maybe. Rochester's right, maybe she's not that bright. She used to curse her husband. How many wives have sworn at their hapless hubbies? He calls her intemperate and unchaste, yet gives no evidence or further elaboration on the latter. So, is this just another way of Rochester justifying his own actions and getting the sympathy vote in a desperate at attempt to reinstate his night of loving sex with Jane that he's been presumably longing for months? So the modern reader must question both Bertha Mason's diagnosis of madness and her treatment in Jane Eyre. Is Bertha as much a victim of her husband's rigid specifications of what a wife should be as her own mental frailties? Is Rochester really as kind as he tries to make us believe by confining her to a dark, secluded room of his mansion, never letting her get out, guarded by a hard-drinking brute of a fellow woman? Within 19th century literature, do we get a sense that virtually nothing is understood about the complexities of mental health and that novels such as Jane Eyre, The Women in White and Lady Audley's Secret reveal far more about patriarchal systems of control and female vulnerability than what we would nowadays term genuinely mad. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production exploring the presentation of madness within key 19th century texts including Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Mary Elizabeth Braddon's um, Lady Audley's Secret and Wilkie Collins's The Woman in White. Many thanks for watching.